Om Sam Sarasvati Namaha. Namaste. Namaste. On page 230, Ashtamovadhyaya, chapter 8. Dhyanam. Om Varunam Kurunatarangi Takshing. Indrita Pasham Kushapanam Chapakasam. Anima Diti Pir Abhim Pritam Mayukir. Amitiva Bibava Kipapanim. Om Rishi Ruacha Chandicha Nikate today, Mundicha Pinipati day, Ole Shoot, the Sanye Shoot, Shagis Day Spots, Race for Ah, Tadako Papu Radinam, Teta Sumba Padapaban, with your cancer for Sainanam, Toya Amati Day Shagam, Adjasa Babu here, Toya. Shadasi Diru Daida, Kambunam Chatrashi Dir, Niyam Kuzma Plir Vrita, Koti Vir Dhani Panchashat, Asura Dhan Kulani Vey, Shadha Kulani Dhamramam, Nikachan Dhumamakeha, Kalaka Dhorita Marga, Kalaka Yastata Sura, Yudhyaya Sacha Dhirantu, Adhyaya Tvarita Mama Idhyaya Tvarita Surapati Shumbo Moira Pastasana Nijika Mamakasanya Sahasvir Babu Dhirita Ayam Tamchandika Dhirita Tathaya Madhuri Shana Jaswaini Dura Yamasa Dharmi Kanta Tantra Tathasik no mahanada, Adhiva Pritvan Vipam, Gantasvani Nathanam, Amikacho Pavagri Hatat, Tanirja Singha Kantanam, Nadamurit Dinka, Ninadi Vishni Kali, Jigavis Taritananam, Tani Nada Bhupasvityam, Dvaita Sain Yoshita Turdi Sam Devi Singhastata Kali Shasuri Roshi Parhi Paritam Etasmin Nature Bhuma Vinasanya Sirardi Sam Bhavaya Mara Singha Nam Atibir Gavalamita Prameshat Kusha Vishnu Kula Vishnu Nam Tathendra Shatta Sattra Gyam Shri Rebhya Vinish Yam Yam Tharu Vrishta Dekanya Dhu Yashya Dekvasya Gyarupam Yatha Bhushan Bhannam Tvatvati Bhattita Shaktir Asura Nyod Mual Bhaya Antha Yukta Himana Kre Saksa Sutra Sakamandalu Ayata Brahmana Shakir Brahmani Savidiyate Maheshwari Prisharuta Pishuna Moradarini Mahani Balanya Brahma Chandrika Vipushana Komari Shakti Asacha Mayura Morabhahana Yodul Bhajani Yodhvityam Amita Guharubini Tateva Poishnavi Shatir Gurudo Pari Sankhita Shanka Chakra Kandashanka Karga Hasta Pyu Pahayo Yagavar Akamatula Rupanya Bhimato Hare Shakti Samyaya Yodhatra Bharati Dibrati Tanum Narasimhi Nisangasya Vibrati Sadhu Sambhavu Prata Tatra Tadakshipa Shita Nakshat Sanghati Vajra Hasta Tati Bhandri Gajra Jovari Sita Prata Sanghasra Nayana Yata Shakta Sati Vasa Tata Pari Vita Sabir Ishano Devastatibi Anyantam Asura Shibram Mama Vridhyaka Chantikam 
Prabhatina, Satmasya Chiroyada, Babaharatam Purushas, Rojata Sakasasa, Oishmi Sarijina, Charina Bijina Magadata, Gadayata Vikamasa, Andri Tamatarishwara, Oishmi Chakramina Sya, Rudi Rasrava Sambhavayi, Sahasa Chodja Gapyatam, the Pramadayam Bhattasri, Satya Chitana Komari, Bharati Chakadasina, Maheshwari Kishuleda, Ratri Jamakasra, Sachapi Kada Kadakya, Sarvati Vahna Prita, Mati Kopasma Prishto, Ratri Jamakasra, Tashyaka Sapakuda, Saki Sulani Nilbuli, Babata Yoga Bay Rokos, Karasti Sancha Sotsara, Tashya Surasrit in Saputir, Asuri Saka Yamjikat, Yapta Masaita Todiba, Moyamara Chakuru Rutama, Tambishanat Surandiswa. Chandika Prakasatra, Uachakali Chamunde, Vizir Nam Bhavanaguru, Machastra Pata Sambhutan, Rakhidu Mahasuran, Rakhidu Pratichatvam, Patrinani Nepegina, Machakan Vicharani, Drupananda Mahasuran, Eva Mesha Chayanavitya. Shirinana Bhakto Yameshati Bhakshamana Sthaya Chukra Atut Pasyanti Chavari Iyukvatam Tathodi Shuliya Bhinja Kali Kham Mukhena Kali Chavari Ratri Jasya Shorita Tathod Sabhati Kanata Jagadaya Tantra Chandika Nachasya Pekadam Chakre Kadapa Koti Yukama Pe Tashya Kala Tashya Deyatu Pahusu Srava Shodidam Gisthasta Tasta Bhatrena Kramunda Sampriti Chakri Mukhe Samur Kataishya Radhavatam Bhakasura Tashya Tata Chamunda Pabhota Shyata Shoritam Devi Sulena Bhadrena Bhamir Siddhi Vrishtipi Jagana Rathvi Chantam Chamunda Pita Shoritam Sapabhata Vrti Vrishne Shastra Sunda Samatika Nirakta Shabhaki Pala Rathvi Jomathasura Tathaste archim matulam Abhapus prita shanita Tesham akrita nao jato Nanarta sangras dhodpata And let's return to page 230 and read the meditation. I meditate upon Bhavani, the embodiment of existence, the grantor of perfection, who is surrounded by rays of light and other subtle energies. Her body is of red hue, her three eyes are exuberant with compassion, in her hands are the net, the curved sword, the bow, and the arrow. And the Rishi said, when the Lord of Thought became aware of the death of passion and anger and many of their army, then excessive anger filled the mind of the infamous self-conceit and he ordered all the armies of thought to march to war. Today, let all thoughts of strength arise. Let the 86 plunderers of peace holding weapons and 84 without a restraint assemble with all their forces. I order 500 million warriors of the family of thoughts to 
to assemble and the assemblage of hundreds of the family of vices, let them march off to now, let's just say, uh, 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 stop for a moment and understand that these 86 plunderers of peace and 84 who are without restraint are ex not exactly a list of, a, 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 a quantifiable obstacles that come to per perplex us. It just means I'm ordering everybody. I'm ordering as many 500 million. I want every thought that's possible to come to the mind of that meditating yogi and disturb that yogi as much as possible. And let them march off to war. I don't want that yogi to sit still in peace. And let the thoughts born of calamity and thoughts born of perplexed hearts and recurring thoughts and fears of the unknown be ready for war and immediately set forth at my command. So here we have thoughts uh, of calamity and we have thoughts of perplexed hearts. You know how, uh, how difficult it is to heal that broken heart. And recurring thoughts, oh, not that one again. And all the fears of the unknown, everyone be ready for war. After the command, the fearful king of thought, self-conceit, the terrible ruler, marched to battle surrounded by thousands of warriors. When she saw that exceedingly terrible army approaching, she who tears apart thought made the twang of her bowstring hum from the earth to the sky. Mwang. O king, then the lion of the goddess began to roar extremely loudly, and the mother of the universe increased the noise with the sound of the bell. With the twang of the bowstring, the roar of the lion, and the sound of the bell, the hum of sound rose in all directions. From the tremendous mouth of the remover of darkness came a dreadful sound, even greater than the others. Remember, that's Kali. Her roar was even louder than all the preceding sounds. Having heard the tumultuous sound in all four directions, the warriors in the army of thoughts angrily surrounded the goddess, the lion, and the remover of darkness. Well, you can see sometimes on when we all sing the chandi together, the roar of sound, the hum of sound is not exactly quiet. And the thoughts come and surround us, and yet we continue to sing. Your Highness, at this time, in order to slay the thoughts and to raise the gods back to heaven from the bodies of the creative capacity Brahma, the consciousness of infinite goodness Shiva, and the consciousness that pervades all Vishnu, and also from the rule of the pure Indra and other gods as well, energies emerged in forms that possessed extreme valor and tremendous strength, and these forms joined in the battle with she who tears apart thoughts. So each of the gods emitted their Shakti, and the Shakti took on a female form of the deity. In the same dress and ornaments with the same carriers as the gods possess, in that same appearance their energies came to fight in the war with the thoughts. Seated upon a carrier yoked to the swans of idle breath, displaying a rosary and a begging bowl, came the energy of the creative capacity called creative energy. From Brahma King Brahmani. The energy of the great seer of all arrived riding upon the bull of discipline.
discipline, bearing the trident of unity and wearing bracelets of great serpents of energy with a digit of the moon of devotion shining on her forehead, Maheshwari came from the Hishwari. The energy of the ever pure one, the mother of the universe, who is the form of consciousness, holding the weapon of energy to arrive there by the peacock of beauty to fight with the thoughts in the battle. Kumari. The, and the energy of the consciousness that pervades all arrives sitting upon the great bird of brilliancy, Garud. That's Vaishnavi. With the concha vibrations, the discus of revolving time, the club of articulation, and the bow of determination, the sword of worship in her hands with which to fight. The energy of the incomparable he who pervades all, the most excellent desire of union, Varaha, the boar, also bore the form of a boar and presented herself, Varahi. The energy of the illustrious man lion Narsing of courageous fortitude took the same form and arrived. Narsingh. From her fearful roar and the toss of her hair, the stars were scattered about the sky. Mounted upon the king of elephants, the energy of the rule of the pure Indrani arrived with the thunderbolt of illumination in her hand. She had a thousand eyes just as he. After all the energies of the gods had collected, the great god, Mahadev, said to she who tears apart, Chandi, I will be pleased if you will quickly slay all these thoughts. Make these sadhus thoughtless. And then from the body of the goddess manifested the excessively fearful and extremely terrific energy known as she who tears apart thought, who made noise in the manner of numerous jackals. So from within Chandi came another form of Chandi, and she made a horrendous sound. That invincible goddess said to the one of dark matted hair, the great god, Shiva, who Chandi says to Shiva, a supreme lord, you please go to self-conceit and self-deprecation as my ambassador. Uh, I'm sending you as the ambassador. Chandi is sending Shiva. Tell those two extremely conceited ones, self-conceit and self-deprecation, and any other thoughts there ready to wage battle, this order, okay? You're my ambassador, you go to those thoughts, you tell those conceited thoughts, my order. If you want to live, then return to the lower worlds and let the rule of the pure be the king of the three worlds and let the gods enjoy their portion of sacrifice. Get out of this yagya right now. If you are a thought, you don't belong here. You just go find another place to live Nietzsche, uh, somewhere below. Because uh, the gods are going back to but if in the strength of your collected pride you still defy, desire to fight, then come on. My manifestations will be pleased to enjoy your flesh. We eat thoughts like you. <laughs> That's the good menu. All those thoughts are going to be devoured and digested. Because this goddess sent consciousness himself as her ambassador to the thoughts, she has become known in the world as she for whom consciousness is emissary. Uh, she the duty. Uh, she sends consciousness to represent her. I mean, who else could order Mahadev? <laughs> hey, be my ambassador and give him this message. She the duty. 
those great thoughts, hearing the words of the goddess from the mouth of consciousness in great anger, went to where the ever pure one was brilliantly shining. Then from above, the wrath of the thoughts caused a rain of arrows, energy, spears, and other weapons upon the goddess. She playfully cut to pieces the arrows, pikes, energies, weapons, and battle axes hurled at her by the enemy thoughts with the great arrows let loose with the twang of her bowstring. Look at all the thoughts that come to us every time we try to be still, and every one of them shoots off another arrow at us and says, get up, I'm going to wound you, I'm going to pierce you, I'm going to torment you until you leave that asan. Don't sit at the altar putting flowers at the feet of that, that divine mother. Come, enjoy the thoughts, enjoy the world, come with us, we'll show you so many wondrous things. And the goddess, without the slightest exertion, playfully cuts their arrows to pieces. All their weapons are ineffective. Then the remover of darkness went in front of those enemies and striking with her pike began to kill them. With the missiles of consciousness she reduced them to powder on that battlefield. Tunic. Made them all into powder. <laughs> Creative energy sprinkled water from her begging bowl <laughs> on groups of thoughts and on whomever the water fell, his vitality and valor were destroyed. He just cooled off immediately. All his vitality, all his valor were immediately destroyed with just a few drops from the begging bowl of Brahmani. The energy of the great seer Maheshwari with her trident, all the unity of the threes, the energy of the consciousness that pervades all, Vaishnavi with her discus, and the ever-pure one with her energy, her, what is the energy of the ever-pure one? The energy of purity, battled with the thoughts in fierce rage. The energy of the rule of the pure struck with her thunderbolt, killing hundreds of thoughts and confusions who fell to the ground with blood flowing. Again, all the passion is being drained from the thoughts. The energy of the most excellent desire of union, this is Varahi, killed many with the blows of her snout. <laughs> and many chests she punctured with her prominent tusks. And many thoughts fell to their death from the blows of her discus. The energy of the illustrious bad lion killed many great thoughts with her claws and devoured them. <laughs> She filled the sky above the battlefield with the hum of her roar. Many of the thoughts fell to the ground from fear of the excessively furious laugh of she for whom em consciousness is emissary. <laughs> she was laughing at them, and she relished their taste in her mouth. There goes another thought. Can I pass the mustard, would you please? <laughs> Seeing the multitude of mothers slaying such great thoughts in various ways, the army of thoughts began to run away. Seeing the oppressed thoughts fleeing from the forces of the mother, the seed of desire, a great thought of bounteous strength, entered the fight in excessive rage. When a drop of blood from his body touches the ground, another great thought with the same intensity is born in that very same place. So look at this Rakta Bija. Rakta means uh, passion, Rakta means uh, red, Rakta means blood, Rakta means desire. And Bij is the seed. So he's the seed of the desire, he's the seed of passion, he's the seed of the drop of blood. Whenever one drop 
of the blood of the seed of desire touches the ground, a new seed of desire is established immediately and he has the same armaments, the same capacity to captivate the mind, the same force, strength in which to entrap us as servants of self-conceit. Just look at how the seed of desire operates. Say you desire something. Please desire something. A car. A car. Okay, in order to get a car, that's just one drop of blood. Just touch the ground. Now, in order to get the car, I need something else. Probably I need a driver's license. Uh, uh, now, uh, another drop just touched the ground. In order to get the, the driver's license, I need to pass the driving test. Another drop. In order to take the driving test, I need to get the driver's test booklet. Another drop. In order to get the driver's test booklet, I need a ride to the driving test department. How about another day? Another day. Another day. I'm sorry, you'll have to speak in English. Another day. Pure love. Pure love, yes. So anytime we want something from the world, a drop of blood touches the ground. And every time a drop of blood touches the ground, with the same intensity, another great thought is born in that very place. The energy of the rule of the pure began to fight with this great thought who held the club in his hand. Then she smote the seed of desire with her thunderbolt. Wounded by the thunderbolt, blood poured forth from his body. And for every drop of blood that touched the ground, there appeared the same form and equally fierce. For as many drops of blood that poured forth from the wounds of the seed of desire, just so many warriors manifested, all equally valiant, equally strong, and equally fierce. Those warriors born of the seed of desire possessed extremely fearful weapons, and they began a violent battle with the multitude of mothers. You want this? You want that? You need this? Let's go to let's go to Walmart. <laughs> when he was wounded on the head by that meritorious thunderbolt, and the blood began to flow, then from it. Thousands of warriors were born. The energy of the consciousness that pervades all struck the seed of desire with her discus. The energy of the rule of the pure smote that great general of the armies of thought with her club. Wounded by the discus of the energy of consciousness that pervades all, profuse blood poured forth, manifesting in thousands of great thoughts, so that soon the entire gross world was pervaded by the seeds of desire. Everywhere we looked, we wanted something else. Actually, all we saw was desire everywhere. Every perception yielded another form of inadequacy or incompleteness within myself, and therefore desire was born. Oh, I would be more complete, more fulfilled if I had looked like that. If I, if I was as pretty as she is. If I was as nice as that. If I had that, if that would make me better. The ever pure one struck that great thought, the seed of desire, with her energy. And the energy of the most excellent desire of union with her sword and the great seer of all with her pike. That means all the goddesses started fighting with all the seeds of desire. And every time they were wounded, they bled. And every time the blood fell on the ground, a new seed of desire was born immediately. In great anger, that great thought, the seed of desire himself, struck with his club and all the energies of the mothers. Wounded by the energies, pikes, and other weapons, the blood 
poured forth from his body as a river, and certainly there were uncountable thoughts born from it. In this way, the thoughts born of the seed of desire pervaded the entire perceivable universe, and the gods became greatly frightened. Oh, no! Seeing the god's dejection, she who tears apart thought promptly told the remover of darkness, Hey, slayer of passion and anger, expand your mouth. Uh, say, ah, uh, open your mouth. Quickly eat all these seeds of desire and all these great thoughts that come from the seed of desire when he is struck with the blows of my weapons. So this is Kali. Open your mouth. Stroll about the battlefield and eat all of the great thoughts born of that blood. And as all of the blood is wasted, he will soon destroy himself. So she got underneath the wounds and she took in all the blood. And therefore, no blood touched the ground. So there were no seeds of desire born. When you will eat all those fearful thoughts, then new thoughts will not be born. Thus saying, the goddess who tears apart thought struck the seed of desire with her pike. And the remover of darkness took his blood in her mouth. And then he struck she who tears apart thought with his club. But the goddess felt no pain from the blow of the club. Still, the blood continued to flow from his wounds. But whatever blood fell, the slayer of passion and anger took in her mouth. And that's why she sticks out her tongue. So she can drink up all the seeds of desire. As many great thoughts as were born from that blood, she instantly took into her mouth, and she also drank the blood. And then the goddess fought with the seed of desire and with her pike, a thunderbolt, bow, sword, and spear, while the slayer of passion and anger drank the blood. O okay. king, the seed of desire was wounded by that great collection of weapons and deprived of blood, that great thought fell to the ground. And the gods attained inconceivable bliss. No more desires. And the multitude of the mothers, delighted from the drink of his blood, danced vigorously with joy. Oh. So this is the story of the death of the seeds of desire. And when we give all of our desires to mother, and she takes them away, then all we desire is mother. And that's enough for us. And all this other stuff is just whatever is necessary for me to get to mother, that's the amount we need. That's our choice. We give her all the seeds of desire. Are there any questions? Swamiji, here the seed of desire, does it represent both the fulfilled and unfulfilled desires? No, actually he represents unfulfilled desires because you don't think about the fulfilled desires. Once you desire something, you think about the things that you want, you're lacking, you don't have. You don't think about what you've got already. You think about what more there is to be to come. Desire is funny guy. He, he just, he, he delights us and fulfills us only for a few moments. And then, after that, after that fulfillment, we say, gee, what's next? Let's ch check that one off my list. Now what's next? So, uh, this seed of desire is not for the desires that are fulfilled, that are over, complete, and uh, done away with. Those are old memories. They don't bother us. 
We think about the new things to come, what more there is. Are there other questions? Swamiji, uh, there's a question from Nanda from San Jose. Namaste Nanda Ma. Could you please explain the significance, if any, of the energies appearing with the same dress and weapons and vahans as the counterpart? Yes, uh, these goddesses are born or they, they, they manifest from the heart of consciousness. So the masculine form, it, it represents the consciousness and the feminine form is the manifestation or the energy. And the energy, it, it takes the same form as the, the consciousness. So in the same form as Shiva appears, then uh, Shiva comes. And she looks and acts just as he. She is his representative just as he is her ambassador. And the same is true for all the other goddesses. They all take the form and ride on the carriers. They have the, uh, the attributes. They share the common attribute with their partner. That is the verse from Lolita Trishakti. Shiva and Shakti revolve around each other mutually and reciprocally. This is a mutual and reciprocal relationship. They are so interconnected that they appear in the same form as each other. Swamiji, Ananda says, it seems to me that if I were to have no desires, then I would have no zest for life. Can you please help me understand how it helps to have, how it helps one to have no more desires? Thank you so much. Yes, Nanda, you see, it's not the old desire that is done away with because desire is inherent within the creation. Icha, Kriya, Jnana Shakti. These three forms, Icha means desire. Uh, kriya means action. And Gyan means knowledge, and these three are inherent within the three gunas. So it's only the selfish desire that is actually, is actually consumed by the goddess. She takes away all of our selfishness. And then we think, how can we do the most we can for the most who can be positively, positively affected by it? And we create that effect the effect that is most pr pr promising, most uh, desirous for the most amount of people. The greatest amount of people will cre create, or derive the greatest benefit. So it's not exactly getting rid of all desire. You'll still have to eat. You'll still have to, to sleep. You, you will, from time to time. Swamiji, you spoke about the feeling of incompleteness, non-fulfillment, which comes with Rakta Bija and worldly desires, but in spiritual life too, Rakta Bija appears. Oh, I wish I could pronounce this better. I wish I could sit longer. I wish I knew the proper Padhoti. Is that all Rakta Bija again? It, it is all Rakta Bija again. And, but this Rakta Bija is the desire of purity, the desire to unite with your guru, to unite with the knowledge, to come closer to the goddess. So this Rakta Bija is the positive form. And we want him to take away the negative form that keeps us out in the bazaar and keeps us out in karma and makes us go to the market every other day. And we want to take away that Rock the Bija, and then have the Rock the Bija take over who says, okay, now the next step in my spiritual progress is to sit down, to breathe deeply, to recite the Sanskrit, to come closer to God, to pay greater attention. So as we spend less and less time with the negativities of Rock the Bija, then the positive Rock the Bija takes over again and again and takes us closer and closer so that all we're thinking for is the upliftment, the benefit of others. Swamiji, question from Janitri from Virginia. Namaste Janitri Ma. Pranam to Ma and Swamiji. Is blood symbolic of something or does it refer to blood that pulses through our veins? 
No, Journey 3, it is symbolic of passion and passion and, and desire. And actually, this Raktabija, he is the seed of desire, he's the passionate desire, the negative passionate desire that gets us into, it draws us deeper and deeper into worldliness. Uh, so that's what it symbolizes. And he, all throughout the battle, when the blood flows from the Asuras, it means that they no longer bear any passion towards us. We are not passionate about them. They no longer have the capacity to entrap us or to, we have no attachment to them. We lose all the passion, all the attachment. Swamiji, question from Ambika from New Jersey. Namaste, Ambika, ma. Uh, Pranam, ma and Swamiji, water is often used as a purifying element as we see in verse 33. Would you kindly speak to us about the power of water and how we can use it in our daily life? Well, you use it in so many ways, but first of all, we take a bath every morning and that's a purifying exercise. <laughs> And then we consecrate ourselves and abhishek and, and perform the, the systems of, of purification again and again. We purify our mouth and our hands uh, with achman. We, we purify the articles by abhishek. Uh, uh, everything we're going to offer in the puja, we purify. It, it, water is a symbol of the flow of life. And it is a symbol of purity. And it is also the... The, the analogy for equilibrium because it's always in balance it's always uh, in the same level it always seeks its own level so Varuna is the lord of waters and he's also the lord of equilibrium a question from Joy from New York Namaste Joy reciting the Chandi is a new experience every time so speaking about an experience can diminish its essence. Is there a benefit of recording it in a journal? If yes, what if one's vocabulary and intellect simply fail to capture the evolving nature of the experience? Joy, the, the only benefit of recording the experiences in the journal that I found is that in some years later you can go back and read uh, the journal and say, oh, I've come this far, now I don't need these, <laughs> these journals anymore. I don't need this anymore. The objective is not to collect experiences. The object objective is to know the experiencer. Who is having this experience? Not what it is I'm seeing or what it is I'm feeling, but the intensity that brings me deeper and deeper into this relationship with the goddess. The intensity is what you want to remember, Joy, not the, the manifestation of the experience. Swamiji, you said we should offer our desires to Divine Mother. What, how do we do that? We do that by desiring her more and more. And in order to desire her more and more, we want to desire her saints and her wisdom and her knowledge. So we want to stay with satsang as much as we possibly can. And then increase the, uh, the intensity and the amount of time that we spend in satsang. So if we can't be physically with the guru, then let's be metaphysically with the guru. And let's see, how would the guru respond to these circumstances? Can I do something similar in my own life? And try to have satsang throughout the day. How would Shrima handle this circumstance? How would she respond to this situation? Could I do something like that myself? These would be ways to become closer to the goddess, closer to her saints, closer to our own sadhana, understanding our own position and how we will evolve, how we will move towards that ultimate union that we're seeking so greatly. Yes, go on, please. Um, sometimes, a, a, like the desire to chant a chandi can be quite overwhelming, but because of, 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 of uh, having to do other things, 
it's not possible to do that. Can that desire, does that desire also uh, be remaining unfulfilled, does it also help us eventually in, in bringing us closer towards that? Absolutely, because you could say to the to mother, uh, the goddess, I love you so much that I'm going to sacrifice the thing I love the most, which is to recite uh, 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 your scripture and spend time with you. I love you so much that I'm going to demonstrate my love for you by going out and doing this other action just to serve you. Look at I, I, I'm not going to chant the chandi today. I'm going to serve you by doing, I'm chopping wood and carrying water because I know you need the wood and you need the water. And now look at the sincerity of my love. And if I really love you, Mom, when I get through with chopping wood and carrying water, I'll come back and I'll read whatever I can of the chandi. If not the whole thing. Oh, yes. That desire is overwhelming, and now I sacrifice my overwhelming desire because I've got a greater desire, and that desire is to demonstrate to you how much I love you. I'm giving up the thing I love the most, which is reading to you, and now I'm going to go out and swing an axe and carry buckets and, and you know, chop wood and carry water for you just to show you how much I really love you. Swamiji, uh, Surat and Samadhi, Samadhi was cast out by his family and Surat fled from his kingdom. Was that the highest ideal for them? Should they not have stayed and resolved their conflicts? Well, no, their highest ideal, first of all, Surat the king was, his kingdom was taken over by enemies. So he didn't really uh, abandon the kingdom. Uh, he he was forced out of the kingdom. His unscrupulous ministers took over the army and the treasury and defected to the enemies. So they put him out, just as Samadhi was put out from his home. So it really wasn't a choice that they made to, to leave. But now, was it their highest ideal of perfection? Obviously it was, because here it is, yugas later, and we're remembering their story and admiring their realization. We are benefiting so much by their association. Just because of what they did when they left, what did they do? They didn't say, oh, those bad kids. They said, how can I, uh, I, I wonder what's happening to them. Are they, are they following the way of Dharma or not? Are they happy now that they've taken over my wealth? Are they happy now that they've pushed me out of the kingdom? Uh, and then they said, now, what do I want to do with the rest of my life? I want to, to love the goddess. I want to do the sadhana for the, to, to, to achieve self-realization. And they did. And they got the boons. And the goddess blessed the king with the kingdom of good thoughts and made him Savani, he who belongs to all. Every tribe, every caste, every creed, they're all his. And she said to, some, uh, to uh, Samadhi, the, the, the businessman, uh, I give you imperishable wisdom. So they are, we're remembering their story. They must have done something right. <laughs> Samiji, question from Ambika. Yes, Ambika. I'm confused about the borders between disciple and guru. For example, we are supposed to be respectful and not speak unless spoken to. And at the same time, we are supposed to ask questions. If the question is truly from our heart, is there nothing we can ask? How do we not make mistakes in the presence of our beloved and most respected Guru? Thank you. Ambika, love him with all your heart. Love her the way you want to love the Divine Mother. Of course you should ask questions. It's not that you shouldn't speak until spoken to, but you shouldn't interrupt what she's saying in order to say what you want to say. That would be disrespect. But there's a balance. It's not all one way or all the other way. 
Uh, it, there's a balance and be natural and be free. Because the relationship between a guru and a disciple is a relationship between two lovers. And they both love wisdom. They're lovers of God. And the, 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 the guru has experienced godliness in a certain form of worship and she can show that form of worship to an attentive disciple. So certainly we encourage a, an attentive disciple to ask questions, but ask it the, the right question at the right time and you'll get the right answer. And if you come barging in and say, Guruji, I've got to have the answer to this question right now. Drop everything you're doing and pay attention to me on my time, then probably you won't have the result that you're looking for. But it, there will be a time with your guru that you can sit down just as we're sitting tonight and asking all the questions you choose to ask with no inhibition and no limitation and no prohibition. And then that's the appropriate circumstance conducive to learning. So in the beginning, in chapter 1, the, the businessman and the king observed all the customs and congenialities conducive to learning. Om Sam Saraswati Namaha. Namaste. Namaste.